Soldiers of the Press. He has been on raids with Marine Colonel Meriday Edson. He has been shelled by destroyers, cruisers, and submarines. He has endured with the rest of us our daily bombing raids. He has lived a Marine's life under jungle conditions. Robert C. Miller is a good Marine. That is a Marine's tribute to a newspaper man. They are the words of Major General Alexander A. Vandergrift, commander of U.S. Marine forces at Guadalcanal. Robert C. Miller, soldier of the press, is a United Press war correspondent accredited to the United States Pacific Fleet. Disregarding all personal risks, Miller accompanied American forces, which launched the first great Allied offensive in the Pacific. He landed with them on the hostile beach of Guadalcanal early last August, and ignoring warnings of grave danger and recommendations that he withdraw, chose to remain there during the first six bitter weeks of U.S. occupation of those inhospitable islands. We recreate for you his story of the adventure, the action, the heroism that lie behind the official communiques, as Miller recorded it for United Press in his Guadalcanal notebook. Yes, I'm a war correspondent. Six months ago, I was working in the Los Angeles Bureau of United Press, where I got my assignments neatly written out on a slip of paper, or from a UP bureau manager who would tell me, grab yourself a cab and beat it over to 20th and Pine Streets. Some dame has barricaded herself in her apartment and is threatening to shoot the cops. With a correspondent assigned to the fleet, it's different. You never know where you're going or what your story will be. In fact, you may accept a three weeks assignment with a task force and come back with nothing to show for it but a pair of sea legs. Then again, you may find all hell breaking loose around your ears at any minute. I had arrived in Honolulu, complete with uniform and a green armband with a large white C, which marked me for a war correspondent. I was itching for a chance to see some action, but for weeks, nothing happened. Then one afternoon, I was called to the phone by a Navy officer who told me to report to him in sea gear within the hour. I tossed my clothes together hurriedly and soon was clambering up the ladder of a warship. Your credentials, sir? Oh, certainly. Here you are. Miller's the name. Robert C. Miller of United Press. Uh-huh. Well, let's see now. Well, these seem to be in order. Oh, yes, I have you listed. This way, please, and I'll take you to the officer of the deck. Thanks. I'm right with you. Here we are. Uh, sir, this is Robert Miller of United Press, accredited to the fleet and assigned to this unit of the task force. His credentials are in order, sir. How do you do, Miller? I'm glad to know you. I'm glad to have you with us. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be with you, too. Uh, by the way, I wonder if it's possible yet to give me some idea of what sort of an assignment I'm on. <laughs> it's my first time out, you know. I'm sorry, Miller, but all I can tell you at this point is that we are a task force on a secret mission. But... It might make you feel better to know that the chances are you'll see some action. You'll be given full details in due time. Here you are, Miller. These are your quarters. The supply officer will look in on you shortly to fit you out with a steel helmet, life jacket, gas mask, and other gear. Well, we're getting underway. I'll have to be off now, but I'll look in on you again after mess. Best of luck, Miller. Thanks for everything. Good luck to you, too, sir. He's hoping your predictions pan out that we'll see action. For days, the task force plowed through the Pacific under a blazing sun. An air of tense expectancy filled the ship. The equator was crossed, and Miller was transformed from a polywog to a shellback. It's a ceremony performed with barrel staves for those aboard who are entering the southern hemisphere for the first time. Miller wrote the next day's entries in his notebook standing up. The task force put in at a South Pacific island for supplies and reinforcements. Speculation mounted. Then Miller wrote this entry in his notebook. They came today. Additional reinforcements. And what a sight. Ship after ship popped out of the horizon this afternoon until the whole ocean seemed a mass of ships. There's no doubt about it now. Something big is in the wind. I've been put aboard a transport loaded with Marines. I'm all ears. It's eight bells. The captain is to make an announcement over the public address system. Gentlemen, you're all aware from the strength of our forces that we're bound on an important mission. I now am at liberty to tell you that our objective is in the Solomon Islands. Our mission is to drive out the occupying Japanese forces and plant the United States flag over those strategic bases. Hooray! Details of the attack will 
be explained to all battalion commanders tonight in the ready room. Won't be long now. The murky haze is providing a welcome screen for the invasion armada. Everyone seems to be in good spirits. There's little conversation about tomorrow. Nearly everyone's talking about home. If they aren't talking about it, they're thinking about it. I've noticed quite a few Marines topside just leaning over the rail and thinking. General quarters sounds at 4 a.m. Hell of an hour to go to war. We have steak, potatoes, and eggs for breakfast. I notice everyone is feeding himself forcibly, but everyone fills up. The next meal may be a long time coming. All officers are decked out in green, indistinguishable from a private's uniform, and all insignia of rank have been hidden. I understand the Japs give ten extra points for shooting an officer. Well, I'm putting my green armband in my pocket. Who knows, they may give 15 points extra for bagging a correspondent. I join a group of Marine officers on the signal deck. Hello, Miller. Have a nice breakfast? Yeah, just swell. I couldn't taste anything, but I can tell there's something in my stomach. <laughs> Butterflies, maybe, or possibly my heart. <laughs> well, don't worry. You're not the only one with the jitters. It's this waiting that gets you. You'll be all right when the shooting starts. Yeah, this is all going off too smoothly to suit me. I hope it doesn't turn out to be a trap. Say, I can make out a dark outline off there to the right. That's right. That's our objective, Guadalcanal. Hey, look up ahead there. A light. Yeah, it's the signal from the ship ahead for us to anchor. The unbelievable has happened. We're in and the Japs haven't spotted us. Hey, what's that? Oh, relax. That's one of our own planes catapulting into the air. Brother, there's going to be another blitz like Pearl Harbor, but this time the Japs will be on the receiving end. There's the curtain raiser. The show's on. Man, look at those explosions on the beach. There go our boats and tank lighters over the side. Let's oh, go, man. Two loaded. Cut her away. Over the side. Listen to those leathernecks whooping up. Okay, Miller, it's no concert. Down the rope ladder and enter the boat with you. Uh, me? Okay, I'm right with you. Uh, this business of loading reminds me of the subways. <laughs> you pack them in, slam the door, and ready for the next one, huh? Landing boats circle the ships, waiting for the zero hour, while our barrage mounts to even greater fury. Finally, the bombardment lets up and the first boats race shoreward. I watch through glasses as the first of them hit the beach and the tiny figures race inland. I notice that the ones that fall get up and run on, a reassuring indication that possibly there's not much enemy resistance. Now it's our turn. The bow of the landing boat rises high as the coxswain guns are wide open and aims for the palm-studded beach. We catch sight of a signal indicating landing successful. I'm poised in the bow of the boat, surveying landing possibilities when we run aground. Someone gives me a shove, and I land waist-deep in the surf. There's a precarious split second as I waver between a landing and a dunking. With a magnificent recovery, I manage to stumble up to the beach and dive for the nearest thicket. Good lesson for a newspaper man in that first landing. Never get in the bow of a landing boat. It puts you in the embarrassing position of leading the charge up the beach, totally unarmed. August 8th. Night has settled down over the rugged islands for the second time since the Marines set foot on its soil. Nerves are taut. Japanese warships are reported moving in on Guadalcanal. Everyone knows the Japs are going to attack. The convoy rides at anchor in Lunga Bay, spewing out its troops and supplies for the Solomon's invasion. Twenty miles away, the little American and Australian fleet stands guard. Night falls, black, sudden, tropical night. A Japanese plane drones overhead, and the dark is cut through with flares. Miller watches from Guadalcanal Beach. In his own words... In the cold, drizzling rain, I stand and watch the grand and terrible night battle between United States and Australian warships and a Japanese fleet. Almost at the instant the flares spread their cold glare across the black of the sea, mushrooms of yellow flame belch out of the west. Seconds later, the first rumble of the cannonading reaches the beach where the Marines and I stand silently, watching the warships pour their tons of steel at each other. Searchlights run their long white fingers through the night. We stand awestruck. Suddenly, an Australian cruiser, the Canberra, bursts into flame with a roar of explosions that drowns out the guns. Other explosions follow from other ships. We can't tell whose. There is a tremendous roar from the eastern end of the strait, and someone shouts that the Astoria and Vincennes, American cruisers, are afire. They're going to their deaths at full speed, straight into the face of the enemy. Minutes seem like hours. Finally, the gunfire dwindles, stops. The flares sizzle out in the sea. The battle is over, and the most important convoy, possibly, that the United States ever send out has been saved. The Japanese have been beaten, and the Marines are on Guadalcanal.
Next day, Miller established what he described as the first United Press Bureau on Guadalcanal, an assortment of crates and boxes of captured Japanese foodstuffs, which were moved into headquarters tent. Of his handiwork, Miller said, It's not much to look at, but it does give support to your correspondent's typewriter and backsides. Later that afternoon, Miller and Sherman Montrose, a photographer for Acme News Pictures, accepted an opportunity to accompany a patrol into the jungle. Hey, hey, Miller. That patrol's moving on ahead. Come on, let's get a move on. Oh, that's the trouble with you photographers, Monty. You've no curiosity. You want somebody to strike a pose for you so you can click your shutter and move on. Well, what do you see that's so interesting? I don't see anything here that'll enable you to burn up the cables. Look, off left there. Huh? That looks like a couple of abandoned Jap tents. Come on, let's go over. Oh, uh, nuts. I got a camera full of pictures of Jap tents. Here's a Jap machine gun. Looks like somebody left in a hurry. Huh? Say, Monty, there's a dead Jap in this tent. Hey, Monty, he ain't dead. That Jap is alive. Hey, Lieutenant. Hey, hey, you guys with the guns. We got a live Jap prisoner here. Well, that's the way Montrose and I managed to capture the first Jap prisoner taken on Guadalcanal Island, amply reinforced by a company of Marines. I have to admit, it scared me out of ten years' growth. But before Francis McCarthy arrived at Guadalcanal to relieve me six weeks later, that experience seemed tame. I managed to be shot at, and fortunately missed, by just about every weapon the Japanese possess, with the possible exception of one or two experimental jobs that they hadn't brought down to the Guadalcanal proving ground. Included were all types of naval craft, 75 millimeter artillery, machine guns, both light and heavy, mortars, also light and heavy. Then there were bombs, in sizes ranging from 1,000 pounders to the 250 pound so-called grass cutters. But my personal nomination for the height of human misery is to lie in the jungle, wringing wet, in a tropical downpour, while snipers' bullets whine past your head or plop themselves in the trees near you you get the feeling that those 25 caliber rifle bullets have been cast in Japan for you individually and are being delivered personally by a little fella high in the timber above, behind, or beside you. You never do find out just where the hell he is. Yes, in the words of Major General Alexander A. Vandergrift, Robert C. Miller is a good Marine. And Robert C. Miller is likewise a good reporter, conscientious, accurate, true to the finest traditions of American journalism. He is one of hundreds of such men on the worldwide staff of the United Press. We will be back soon with another of these stories of the correspondents who gather and write the news for this station. Be sure to listen. And meanwhile, remember to listen for United Press news on the air. Look for it in your favorite newspaper. It's your guarantee of the world's best coverage of the world's biggest news. <laughs> 